Hello, everybody. Um, so I'm Max. Um, so this is going to be a talk about a project that I started a while back and haven't had as much time recently to work on as I would have liked. Um, it's a project that I've been calling a punchline generator or a punchline generator. Um, the basic idea is that it will create a potential punchline for a joke. You have to compose the setup for the joke yourself. Actually composing that computationally would be a whole other project and a very interesting one that I'd like to work on at some point, but not what we're doing today. Um, so, uh, who am I? Um, currently I work as a research engineer at, uh, yep, um, no problem, um, a research engineer uh, working at the Educational Testing Service. Um, I work uh, in their natural language processing department, um, doing lots of th stuff with like automated scoring and that kind of thing. Um, I'm also one of the organizers of Pi Gotham. Uh, you may have seen me yesterday at the registration desk. Um, I like dogs, music, and chess, and now you know who I am. Um, I am also overly fond of what are arguably terrible jokes. So those are my credentials. So we should start with what is a very good joke. Um, what do you call a blood-sucking cat who runs a town? Obviously, the answer is Fluffy the Vampire Mayor. Um, big thanks to my friend Rebecca for providing the art for that. And thank you to my friend Ellen for, um, while I was building this, I needed a testing phrase. And her favorite show is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So that's what I worked with. Um, so a high level overview of what we're actually building. A user will enter a phrase. We will select certain words from that phrase based on some defined criteria. We will discuss those. We will find other words that sound like those plus some other criteria that we will define. We will replace words with words that sound like them, and we will return them to the user. So we enter Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and it returns something like Fluffy the Vampire Mayor. Again, you have to compose the setup for it, um, but I think we can all agree it turned out to be an excellent joke. So how are we going to do this? Uh, we are going to use what is called edit distance, and Specifically, a, uh, the key algorithm in this is Levenstein distance. So what is this? It's a method of measuring the similarity of strings. Um, this is done with the number of character level edits. You can do it at the word level uh, for specific tasks. Um, it is also a dynamic algorithm, so it runs very fast. Um, why is this used? It's used in things like autocorrect. You mistype something into your phone, it has to figure out other words that actually exist that are similar in spelling to what you're trying to type. Um, at the word and uh, sentence and even document level, this is used for things like plagiarism detection. How can you tell if two documents have a lot of the same things in them? Um, it's also used in other fields other than just natural language processing. It's used in biology, for example, for trying to compare the similarity between genomic sequences. I can't talk about that. I'm not a biologist, but I have heard that it is used in that. So how does it work? We have to define certain possible edits. Um, these are insertions. We can go from A to AB. We've inserted a B here. We have to define costs for these as well. So typically, we would say something like an insertion costs one, one unit, one edit. Uh, we also have deletions. We can remove a character. So to go from the sequence AB to A, we have to delete the character B. Again, we can assign it a cost of one. We also have substitutions, going from one character to another character. Um, there are, di in different tasks, we might want to weight these differently. For now, I'm going to say that a substitution is the equivalent of a deletion plus an insertion, right? We've deleted A, we've inserted B, we've substituted A for B, so we'll call that a cost of two. And very important, if two characters are equal, we need to make sure that we don't have any cost for that substitution. So we're going to call that an equal substitution, cost of zero. Um, other tasks, other versions of this have other possible edits. You might have something like rearranging characters, and you can apply a certain weight to that, a certain cost. So first, why do we need any sort of fancy algorithm for this? Why can't we just say an equal substitution of C to C, an equal substitution of A to A, and then a substitution of the letter B for the letter T, giving us our cost of two. Why doesn't this work to go from cat to cab? 
We start seeing problems when they don't align perfectly. If we go from cat to cart, we get the same zero, zero, and then we get substituting R for T. This is not actually what we'd want to do. We would then insert a T, giving us a total of three, when actually we should only have a, a, a total cost of one. We should just need to insert the R. So this we might say, well, we can look ahead a character or two. But things can get complicated very quickly with something like the word cat to the word scant, which is a word you don't hear very much anymore, but it's actually a pretty good word. Um, so here we would say two for that substitution, two for that substitution, two more. We need to insert an N and insert a T, giving us a grand total of eight. This is way more expensive than it should actually be. This should actually be a total cost of two. So unless we have some kind of look ahead, look back, we have to change everything, um, we would not figure out that really we only need to insert an S and insert an N and we have the word scant, a uh, much lower cost. Um, so we would misevaluate the difference between these two words. So how do we do this? The solution is this dynamic algorithm called Levenstein distance. Um, we can make a grid, we can make a matrix to evaluate this. Um, we align the source, what I'm calling the source word, the, the word that we're starting with and we want to change to. Um, we're going to line that down the side. Across the top, we'll put the target word, the word that we're trying to edit to change it to along the top. We're going to insert empty strings at the beginning of each of these because we will need to evaluate how to get from the empty string to one of these words. Um, so we're going to start and say that the cost of empty string to empty string is zero. Simple enough. We can then fill in what the cost of all of the insertions would be. This is the equivalent of saying the cost of going from empty string to empty string is zero. The cost of going from empty string to the letter S is one. From empty string to SC is two, and so on. Similarly, oh, we, can, we do the same thing going down. Um, we say that the cost of going from C to empty string is one. That's a single deletion. Going from CA to the empty string is two. That's two deletions to give us the, the cost of two, et cetera, for the word going down. OK, so we have three possible actions. We can go diagonally which is a substitution of this letter to this letter. We can go down, which is a deletion, and we can go across, which is an insertion. We only have to pay attention to two things. We need to know if the two letters are the same to know if the substitution cost should be zero, and we need to, need, we need to know what our costs are. So to go from the letter C to the letter S um, should be a cost of two, right? This is a substitution. Or a, a deletion plus an insertion. We get a cost of two for, that, for those substrings from C to S. We can go across. To go from the letter C to the letters SC, this will actually involve the equal substitution of C for C. So we've inserted an S, and now we sub C for C, this is equal. This is going to get monotonous very quickly, which is why I tried to start off with a very good joke, um, because now things are just filling in a grid. We do the same thing. To get from the letter C to SCA would be a cost of two. We continue on to N, to T. So if we were just trying to go from the letter C to the word scant, we would have a cost of four. OK, we can continue on to the next row. Same thing. These are not the same letter, so the same costs. These are not the same letter, so the same cost. And now, because we're going from an A to an A, these are an equal substitution, so we have the cost of 0. So we can see now that if we were trying to get from CA to SCA, our total cost would be one, which makes sense. We would only need to insert the S at the beginning, and the rest are substitutions, equal substitutions. Continue on. If we were trying to go from CA to SCANT, it would be a total cost of three. Finally, to the next row, cost of four, cost of three, cost of two, because that would be from this to this, right? From S from CAT to SCA, 
uh, scan, and finally, scant, and we get our expected cost at the end, right? We said that this should be a cost of two because we're really only inserting the S and the N, and we go from cat to scant, getting us exactly the cost that we want without having to do any kind of crazy alignment and looking ahead. We break it up into subproblems of the substrings, and once we get the cost of each of those, they're remembered in our grid, and we only have to look back at those. Okay, so we could also, in this process, if we want to, add in things like the actual operation that we're doing, the actual um, insertion, deletion, substitution. So if we also cared about what the path was to get to this, we could add in those values to remember it as well. But right now, we're only concerned with the cost. So this is the algorithm. This algorithm will work in, should work in any programming language that allows for things like a two-dimensional list, right, a, a matrix. Um, so most programming languages. So the important thing here is to understand how the algorithm works. We can actually see its implementation in Python. This is not necessarily the cleanest way to write it, but it's a, a relatively transparent way to write it, so we're going to break it into steps. First, we'll define our empty list that will be filled in with other lists. This is going to be the matrix eventually. Uh, this is our cost. We'll define a first word and a second word. We're going to stick with the same two, cat and scan. Is this large enough for everybody to see in the back-ish? OK, cool. Um, so we define our two words. Next, for each letter in word one and each letter in word two, uh, we're going to create our rows and append, uh, add them in. And then we can visualize it to see what it looks like. And this gives us the matrix that we want. This will be our target word. This will be the source word. And this is where the empty string would be. So that it would be along here and along here. We filled it in with zeros. Perfect. Next, we're going to fill it in with the initial costs. right? So this is what we saw at the beginning of that matrix. We know what the cost of just inserting from the empty string is, and we know what the cost of deleting to the empty string would be. So we have our initial costs in there. Finally, we should define what our actual values are. We're going to stick with the deletion and addition as being 1, and a substitution as being 2. And finally, we're going to loop through every cell in this list. We're going to look back at the um, the row directly above it, we're going to look back at the column directly behind it, and we're going to look back at the cell directly diagonal and back from it. Um, we also need to pay attention to what the letters are because we need to know if they are equal letters here. But we can say that the uh, potential, de the deletion cost will be the cost of the cell back from it. Um, plus whatever our deletion cost is, same with addition, and then we can check to see if our substitutions are equal or not, and then apply the substitution cost. And finally, we can fill them in. Um, and so here, at the end, we get exactly what we expect. The cell in the bottom right corner is the cost that we're looking for. Again, the important thing is really to understand how the algorithm works. Actually writing it in a language is a matter of understanding lists of lists. Um, but otherwise, the actual algorithm should be relatively straightforward if you understand how the core part of it works. If you can do it by hand, programming it is just the next step from there. Um, finally, we can find our actual cost by getting the bottom right cell, our cost of two. Great. OK, we have the initial part of this algorithm. This is the core for it. All right, moving on. Um, an important library that you might want to use is a library called Fuzzy Wuzzy. Um, this is a pretty fun one. It's an open source library that does edit distance very fast. Um, uh, we can uh, compute. It gives a score up to 100. This is uh, going to tell us what the difference between these two words is. It gives us a ratio score. So 75 is going to say 75% match between our word 1 and our word 2. We can do it with longer strings, which is what it's super fast for and very useful for. Uh, this would say that the, these sentence one and sentence two are different by their only 5%, so it gives us a score of 95. Not what we're using in this one, but a useful one to be aware of. So why isn't this enough to do what we want to do? Because English especially is weird. Uh, this is two stanzas from a poem that's a lot of fun. Uh, 
really highlighting how strange English is as a language. Um, English, uh, thank you to my friend Nora for yesterday telling me what these terms are in linguistics. Um, English is what they would call a orthographically uh, deep language, um, meaning it's very hard to tell how to pronounce a word just from reading it. Um, my friend Pablo also pointed out that in English, only, what is it, 80% of words um, are phonetically similar to how they're spelled. Is that remotely close to what it was supposed to be? Something like that. Let's go with that. Um, whereas a language like Spanish, by reading the word, you get a pretty good sense of how it would be pronounced. English is not that. So we need a way to deal with that. Uh, um, um, in linguistics, we typically use the International Phonetic Alphabet. This is a system that's been devised and edited over the years to try to represent as many possible sounds in human languages as possible. These are just the sections for consonants and for vowels. But as you can see, these are characters that we don't typically use in writing, especially in computing. Um, so we're going to look at some other options for this. But this is probably a much more precise way of representing sounds than what we're going to end up using. Uh, we're going to look at two options that use ASCII. Um, the first, and what we'll actually use, um, is the ARPABET representation. Um, so uh, phonemes, the actual sounds in the words, are represented as unique combinations of these ASCII characters. Uh, the potential issue with this, and we'll see that, is that it requires an actual dictionary lookup. These words have to already have been defined by a human and entered into the dictionary. We're going to be using the Carnegie Mellon University Pronunciation Dictionary. Um, an algorithmic version that we can potentially use is called the double metaphone algorithm. A very useful one because it doesn't, it, you can enter any string and it doesn't have to have it in a dictionary. Um, it is less precise though. Similar words are going to have the same representation and so um, not necessarily what we want for what we're doing. Um, we can see uh, a couple versions of this. They both have uh, Python representations, which is very nice. Um, we can look up the word hello, for example, in the CMU dictionary. Um, people pronounce words uh, differently, so we're going to see some uh, alternate pronunciations in here. We have hello versus hello. Um, cat and cot should have different representations, as they do here. Uh, we can see the word vampire is there. And finally, if we enter something that it doesn't have, we're going to get an error. And this is the problem with the dictionary lookup. Um, the double metaphone is going to remove most of the vowels. This is a simplification that is going to give us the phonetic representation. But hello is just going to give us hull, which is pretty good, but not really what we're going to want. We can see the problem here that cat and cot are going to have the same representation. Vampire, again, it will still work. It's going to give us thumper. Um, and the advantage, though, is that it's going to give us something for this this is not a real word string. So some options. Um, I went with the Carnegie Mellon one for uh, my project, but uh, you're welcome to explore some other options. Um, the final thing that we're going to need is parts of speech. We don't want to be replacing a noun with a verb, right? Then the sentence that already isn't going to make sense is going to make even less sense. We've got a couple options for this. Uh, Pentry Bank is a series of... Um, Many, many parts of speech. It gives us 36 possible tags. It breaks up nouns into singular nouns, plural nouns, proper nouns, etc. There's also the universal tag set, which is much simpler, but you can potentially replace a plural noun with a singular one. Um, we have options for how we do this. Uh, if we want to be ex extremely accurate, we're going to have to go with an algorithmic version. Uh, Stanford, for example, has a very accurate um, part of speech tagger. Um, but it also takes longer and requires proper grammar, which if we're just entering a phrase here, we're not going to have. It's trained on things like the Wall Street Journal, which is not how most people write. So it's very accurate if you're trying to get the part of speech of words in a Wall Street Journal article. But if you're trying to get Twitter data, it's not going to work very well. Um, we can also just look up a word in a dictionary. Words have multiple parts of speech, but just getting the most common one for each word, which is what we're going to do here, still works pretty well. It's also faster, and it doesn't care about what the syntax of the sentence or phrase that you're entering is. We can see some quick versions of that here. Um, the Natural Language Toolkit is one of the options in Python to do this. We can take this sentence, we can tokenize it into its individual words, and we can get its parts of speech tags. Um, the Brown Corpus, which we can get also from the uh, Natural Language Toolkit, um, has 
is a corpus of texts from all different genres um, and has a pre-tagged version, so we can use versions of that as well. Um, we can also get the universal tag set version of that. Um, we can see if we try to just get the part of speech tag on a single word, hug, it doesn't have a context and it's going to give us just its most common part of speech. It thinks it's a noun here. Maybe it is, it's just a single word. We can see in two different sentences where hug should be a noun here and a verb here. If we have context, it's going to get it correct. It's worth noting that it gets please wrong. I think please is an adverb here and it's calling it a, a proper noun, maybe because of the capitalization, but it's still getting it wrong even in an actual grammatical sentence. Okay, so that's parts of speech. Um, and that's really the three pieces that we're going to need for generating a punchline. We're going to need, um, ooh, uh, we're going to need the CSV and random libraries. Um, here we can define our algorithm. It's the same exact thing we saw in the other one. Um, there's a couple lists here in case you want to make some changes later. Uh, I will comment on those. Um, this is the exact same algorithm. We can see that it gets the same score for cat and scant here. Um, this is reading in a CSV I created from uh, the CMU dict. It's uh, just a faster way of dealing with it and it also pre-tags all the words that are in it for their part of speech. Um, we get all the unique words for it. And finally, we define it. Um, yep. uh, we can define our function for, uh, sorry, where am I? There we go. Okay, so we can see um, for the word Gotham, how many possible options are there with a price of three, or a price of less than three? Um, it finds only a single option, and that's because its option that it's finding is goth. Goth is pretty close phonetically to Gotham, right? It's just the um that it's adding on. Uh, we can raise our cost slightly. And now we're gonna get more words, but they're also going to be words that sound kind of like Gotham, but aren't super close. We get awesome, that almost sounds like Gotham. Pie awesome, I'd go to that conference. Baham, which, I don't think is a word. Uh, um, Garth, Gossamer, Goth, and Goths. Okay, cool. Uh, we define a function to find these choices. This is essentially just saying only consider words that are the same part of speech and only words that sound enough like the word that we're looking for. And our main function, I defined a bunch of words that we don't care about, words like the and why. These are not words that we necessarily want to replace in a sentence. And finally, we can try it. So let's try it with our old classic. Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and today it gives us Buggy the Vampire Saker, which is, sounds almost like it, I guess. Um, yeah. uh, Buffer the Vampire Sayer, okay, that one's closer. So we can see it's not perfect. This is the most simplified version of it possible. Um, there are some ideas for improvements. One is to vary the cost. If we're going from the letter B to the letter P or the sound B to P, we might want to make that less than the sound B to K. Those are much different sounds. They're made in different parts of our mouths. Uh, we might want to try something like making some kind of thing that takes into account rebracketing. An app sounds a lot like a nap, right? Um, but our algorithm, our algorithm is currently only looking at single words at a time. Uh, spoonerisms are also a fun thing to play with. Save the whales could be wave the sails, right? We're just rearranging two of the sounds in that. Um, possible things to add for next steps. Um, we might also want to play with the actual dictionary that we're using. Um, but in general, that's what I've got. Um, thank you very much. Um, we, you can find me on GitHub. You can also find the educational testing service on GitHub. There's some actually really cool open source projects going on there. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. I'm Death and Maxes. Um, and Thank you. Uh, thank you for attending. How are we doing on time? Uh, do we have time for a couple? For oh, another minute for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, I can take one probably. I'm going to stay for the next couple talks because they're going to be really interesting NLP talks. Uh, but then also I'll probably be at the registration desk again. So feel free to track me down and find me if you have a question. Uh, yes. I mean, I liked Fluffy the Vampire Mayor, um, but maybe I was just drawn to that. Uh, uh, it gave me, um, ah, it, so I tried all the small things because for some reason I was listening to Blink-182 and it gave me all the false fangs, which I was pretty into. Um,
that was a really good one. Some of them were getting bordering on inappropriate, so I'm not going to say them here. But um, they're all the false fangs was pretty good. Um, yes. Did you try to limit it to rhyming? To I haven't tried rhyming. Um, I was thinking that parts of this could be interesting for something like a poetry generator or something like that. Um, I haven't tried just rhyming. Uh, I guess that would be taking into account. It wouldn't be hard, right? Just the vowel sound and maybe the final consonant sound, something along those lines. Yeah, it would be a lot of fun. Uh, I think one more. Yes. Yes, there is a rhyming dictionary. Yeah, it, it would be a fun thing to play with. You're right. Yeah. All right. Very well done. Thank you. And on that note, we're done. Okay. Thank you, everybody.